Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Well, last autumn, we spent a lot of time in Genesis chapters 1 to 3, didn't we? When we thought about the teaching programme, we were aware that there was so much foundational truth in those chapters that actually needs to shape our thinking about many contemporary issues. Hence, this term, once a month, we're going to take a, a particular contemporary issue and explore it and think about it from a biblical perspective. And today we're thinking about racism and how we need to respond to that. We've had read to us uh, verses from Genesis chapter 1, highlighting the fact that every human being has equal dignity and worth as an image bearer of God. And that is why as human beings we're capable of doing so much which is good and noble and right. And yet we know there's another side to the story, isn't there? There's also um, ugly stuff that flows out of our lives. And Genesis 3 tells us why. It's because we've rebelled against our creator. And that rebellion has led to our fallenness, our alienation from God, and therefore the disfiguring of human relationships. The fact that out of our hearts flow things like selfishness and pride, injustice, the abuse of power, feelings of superiority, murderous thoughts, spiteful words and so forth, which of course has a bearing on what we're talking about today. But thank God it, the story doesn't end there, does it? The last study we had from Genesis chapter 3 reminded us that another Adam would come, as it were, and a rescuer to overturn the curse to heal the brokenness and to bring restoration. And so, predicted and foreshadowed through the Old Testament, finally Jesus Christ comes, the one that Genesis 3 points to. And in his cross, he deals with human sins. He rises victoriously. And then on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls upon a gathering of people no coincidence that those people are drawn from all sorts of different places, different countries. Because what God is doing now is he's bringing a healing about in a human heart so that people have a whole different attitude. What he's doing is dealing with the fragmentation between different people and instead building a commu new communities where there'll be harmony and love. The church its an amazing thing. And throughout the years, what he's doing is showing to the world the change it makes living under the Lordship of Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so it is that as we reach the end of the Bible, we find what these little church communities are pointing towards. The climax, a great multitude that no one can count, but from every nation, tribe, people and language. All united, great harmony, all before the throne of God and the Lamb, Revelation 7, 9. A new Jerusalem where nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendour into it, Revelation 21. And so we as Christian believers are supposed to demonstrate relationships that are different, a new lifestyle. But does that mean we're perfect? Absolutely not. As we seek to be a blessing to those around us, do we always do what is right? No, because the church is work in progress. And we need to be aware of that. At a, a Tier Fund staff conference uh, last year, those from black, Asian and other minority ethnic backgrounds were asked to share how they've been feeling during the events surrounding the death of George Floyd and with regard to the racial injustice black people experience, this is what one Christian believer wrote. I felt saddened that the racist past of large segments of the church still runs deep. And you can see it all over social media. I feel drained by the fact that my black skin is still an offence 
in 2020. How tragic is that? Even in the church, still hints of racism, still there. Unless we point the finger at other churches, let's be aware that those same attitudes can lurk in our hearts. So let's be ready for God to challenge us today as we think about this matter. It's not possible to cover everything in the time we have, clearly. This is just really to start us thinking about these things and discussing them together. But we're delighted to have some input today from Krish Kandaya, known to many of us. Krish attended the church while a student at Warwick University. He was actually a member of the staff team uh, from autumn 1998 to autumn 2000. So uh, let's listen to what Krish has to say now, shall we? Five ways to fight racism. Many of us watched in horror as the video of the death of George Floyd went viral on the internet. A police officer knelt on his neck as part of his arrest. What was his crime? Apparently George Floyd was passing on or using a $20 note that may well have been counterfeited. Now, that could happen to any of us. I've been given dodgy £20 notes before. That's not a crime, even if he had done it deliberately. That's not a crime warranting a death penalty. And so this crime has just kicked off a global reaction. For many people, this is normal life, living in fear of the authorities, feeling like they are treated differently because of the colour of their skin. Now, what is a Christian response to this? That's what I want to look at in this little video. Five reasons or five ways to fight racism. And I want to base it on the big picture of the Bible and why the Bible gives us a backbone and a foundation for fighting racism. The first thing I want to say is everyone has dignity, value and worth in the eyes of God. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, God says, let us make man in our image. And so he created them male and female in his image. In his image is a really important term in the Bible. To be made in the image of God does not mean that you look like God, that somehow if you got a, an average picture of all the faces of people around the world uh, and you kind of put them into some kind of merge program, you will have the face of God. No, an image was a representation. A king who had conquered a new territory might set up a statue of himself in the town as a reminder of who is in control. And what happened to that statue, if that statue was defaced, that would be a, a, a sign of insurrection against the ruling power. Many of us remember the, the statue of Saddam Hussein that was pulled down after the liberation of Iraq and, and the rejoicing in the city because what happened to the statue, what happened to the representation, what happened to the image was a signal of how people felt about Saddam Hussein. God is the rightful ruler of the entire universe and so he sets up an image. But what is his image? He creates every single human being in his image. And how we live as human beings is supposed to tell the universe, proclaim to everyone who will look that God is in control. And therefore, that's a huge responsibility. We're supposed to live every day in all that we do in a way that will honour God. But that also means how we treat another person made in the image of God is a reflection of how we feel about God. And therefore, to treat someone without dignity, respect or worth because of the colour of their skin is an insult to God. Hear that very clearly. Racism is an insult against God himself because we're not treating someone in the way that we should treat God. We should treat every single person as if they are a VIP, as if they are intrinsically valuable because they represent God. This is a huge concept. And so we fight racism by treating everybody with value, dignity and worth, whatever their background, whatever their abilities, whatever their sexuality or gender, whatever the color of their skin, whatever their bank balance, we treat everybody with value, dignity and worth. That's one way that we fight racism. Number two, probably the most famous verse in the Bible is John 
3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. Now, did you hear that? For God so loved middle class white people. That's how many people interpret that verse. God so loved people like us, people that look like us, people that dress like us, people that speak like us, people that are educated like us, people that belong to our little group. So often that's the limit of love that we're willing for God to show. God is on our side when it comes to a war. God is on our side when it comes to an argument. But that is not what the most famous verse in the Bible says. It says, for God so loved the world. That means everyone on planet Earth is loved by God. Again, irrespective of their race, their creed, their color, their religion, whatever you want to demark people by, they are blown up by the love of God. God loves every single human being. And that has a huge implication if you want to be a follower of God. That's why God says, love your enemies, because they're not God's enemies. God loves the world. Now, hear this. It doesn't mean that everyone has responded to God's love as we ought to have done. No way. God loves us even though we failed his standards, even though we've uh, rejected his laws, even though we've lived selfishly. God still loves us. And therefore, racism is ungodly. It's wicked and it's evil because it contradicts the love of God. Friends, showing love to people who are different from us, not just our inner circle, not just our little set, not just our neighbours, not people that are in our nice little community, showing love to people, whatever their background, is a way that we fight racism. You don't need loads of money, don't need loads of education, don't need loads of power. All we need to do is to demonstrate the sacrificial, fierce love of God to everyone. That's the challenge. That's as easy to understand as you can imagine, but as hard to implement as you, you can imagine too. And that's why Christians say we are reliant on the person of the Holy Spirit. He's the only one that can give us that kind of world barrier transcending love. For God so loved the world. We are called to show that same fierce love across any boundary you care to put up. Number three. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, we are told there is no other name in heaven or on earth by which men and women can be saved. That was the essential message of the church, that Jesus needed to be proclaimed to the ends of the earth, whatever the cost, because there was no other way that people could be put in a right relationship with God. And therefore, racism is a contradiction of the essential message of the gospel itself. Because if we think that God distinguishes people, not on whether they've put their trust in Jesus, but on the colour of their skin or because of their ethnic background, we've misunderstood the basic element of the gospel, that there's only the sheep and the goats. There's only two types of people in the world. Those that have put their trust in Jesus to be saved for their sins because Jesus died on the cross so that all of us, no matter how far we've fallen, no matter what we've done, can be forgiven, restored, included into a relationship with God, adopted. All of that is only possible because of our trust in Jesus. And, and those people that have put their trust in Jesus want to follow him. They want to recognize that Jesus is king. And the other division is those that haven't. There is no other division in the world that matters to God. It's whether you love and trust and follow Jesus or you don't. Skin colour is completely irrelevant to the gospel because God loves the world. Are you with me? And that's why he sent his only son. If we put up another barrier about who we consider to be in or out, we have contradicted the essential message of the gospel that says there's only one defining factor, whether we have responded to the love and grace and mercy of God or not. And so racism, treating people differently because of the colour of their skin is an offence to God and it is a contradiction of our gospel. Number four. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, we are told that in Christ there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. What are we 
hearing in that verse. It's a really important one. In Christ, in the body of Christ, in the church, the divisions that would normally separate people have no bearing. In the ancient world, a Jew and a Greek often thought of each other in negative terms. Many Jewish men used to get up in the morning and thank God that they weren't born a Gentile, a non-Jew. Uh, for many Jewish people of that day, Gentiles only existed to stoke the fires of hell. And for many Greeks, everyone that didn't speak Greek was considered a barbarian because they just made a funny noise. Ba 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 ba. They didn't speak the right language. We would say the Queen's English. They would say the King's Greek. They resented people that weren't part of their culture. But gospel says that in Christ, in the church, we can't let that division between Jew and Greek have any bearing. Or what about the division between slave and free? A slave was considered in the ancient world an object to be owned by somebody else. And the gap between a slave and a free person in the ancient world was different and bigger than the gap between the Queen of England and a rough sleeper. At least a rough sleeper and the Queen both recognise that both people are human. But in the ancient world, that wasn't the case. A slave was an object, a free person was a human, and there was a vast divide between them. But we're told in the letter to the Galatians that that doesn't matter to God, that in the church there can be no barrier between your social status. Your economic status has absolutely no bearing because we are made a body, we're made a family by being in Christ, by trusting in Jesus and being part of his church. Finally, male and female. In many parts of the ancient world, there was a massive division about the rights that men had and the rights that women had. But in the church, we weren't allowed to let those barriers, those, those different uh, legal codes have any bearing. We were going to show men and women equal dignity. It was going to be the thing that set the church apart. We were supposed to have supernatural sociology. The church wasn't just a gathering of people who were all the same. It was a, a gathering of people who were radically different. And the way that they loved each other was a signal of what the church was really about. Jesus said this, It's by your love for one another that all men will know that you're my disciples. John 13, 35. So the way that... The love of Christ was transcending barriers that separated people, that, that, that turned into wars or oppression or injustice. The way the church was supposed to love across those barriers was the very reason the church existed in the first place, as a signal and a signpost uh, of the grace of God. And so racism in the church denies the very purpose for the church to exist in the first place. Martin Luther King famously said that America was most divided on 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning because we had white church and we had black church. We had rich church and we had poor church. The church was supposed to be a model of what was to come. God's grace breaking into our world and showing his love and mercy to all who needed it. And if the church contradicted that, if we had a segregated church, there was no point to the church at all. Friends, we often point the finger when we see racism. Other people are racist, we're fine. Other people are prejudiced, we're normal. No, sadly, too often the church has modelled the same divisive, oppressive behaviours that we are seeing people reacting to around the world in demonstrations on the streets of America and Trafalgar Square and many other countries in between. Sometimes the church has been complicit in this and we need to confess that we need to change. We need to get our house in order. Look on your bookshelf. How many Christian books are written by people of colour? How many have you read? Are all your books written by white people? How many people do you respect as a Christian leader? How many preachers would you travel to go and hear at a conference? How many of our conferences only have people that are just like us, giving the talks, doing the leadership? Friends, have we got a racial bias in those people that we actually honour and respect in our churches? I remember growing up uh, being inspired by missionaries, and missionaries are amazing. I, I wanted, wanted to be one. I remember a book called Ten Boys Who Changed the World. They were all white people that went around the world telling people the gospel as if there hadn't been a church before white people had taken it to the other nations of the world. That is just not true. Have a look at your mental picture of Jesus. Is he a white guy? Has he got blue eyes and blonde hair? I remember watching Muhammad Ali asking his mum, 
why Jesus was white, why all the angels were white, why all the people in heaven were white. What happened to black people when they died trust in Jesus? Friends, we need to put our house in order because racism in our minds and in our churches def defeats the purpose of the church. Finally, number five, fight racism with a vision of the future. In Revelation chapter seven, verse nine, it says that uh, the apostle John looked and he saw a great crowd beyond number. And it was people from every tribe and tongue and language. It was a beautiful picture of what was yet to come. People worshiping Jesus on the throne, the lamb that was slain. Who is worshiping him? This global body of Christ. And it's made up of people from every nation, tribe and tongue. Friends, if you only want to worship God with people like you, you are not going to be fit for the kingdom of heaven because Jesus deserves to be worshipped by people of every tribe and tongue. We can't deny the future. We're supposed to be a signpost to what the future is about. And therefore, in our address book, in who we get to in invite around our houses when lockdown's over, in those people that we phone up, in those people that we respect, we need to be demonstrating a little bit of the future now that there won't be white heaven and black heaven. There'll just be one new heavens and new earth and all the people worshiping Jesus together. That's our destiny and racism denies and contradicts that future and that again defeats the purpose of the church and what we're called to do friends with these five bits of ammunition from the bible i want your brain and my brain to be rebooted to be aligned with what god's doing this isn't because of black lives matter this is because of what the bible says we should have been living like this and it shouldn't take the death of a black man by a white police officer to kick our brains into thinking that matters. It always has mattered, it's always mattered to Jesus. But it would be wrong for us not to be woken up by this moment. Friends, we need to fight racism with grace, hospitality, compassion and mercy. We need to fight racism by putting our house in order making sure that we treat people well in our lives, in our churches, in our nation. But we need to speak up to. What will you do in light of this challenge from scripture? Will you live a life like I want to live a life full of grace and mercy and compassion? With the power of the Holy Spirit in us, we can. Thanks for listening. We need to fight racism with grace hospitality, compassion and mercy. We need to fight racism by making sure we treat people well in our lives, in our church, in our nation. Well, maybe you felt the Lord putting his finger on something in your life as you were listening to Krish, maybe a particular challenge, but all of us, I trust, have a desire to be continually refined by the Lord, that our hearts might increasingly be like that of our, our Saviour. So we're now going to have another song, the song Purify My Heart. You may want to sing along quietly to this. You may simply want to pause and reflect and pray. But let's allow the Lord to minister to us through the words of this song. 